session number five, and uh, it's the dragon, the one session nobody likes to talk about. I don't like to talk about it either. And uh, as each night, I want to give thanks to Dr. David Jeremiah for writing the book called The Agents of Apocalypse, and a uh, powerful book. After reading that book, it spawned this series that I did a couple years ago, and then I've adapted it to this session tonight. So uh, we'll open in a word of prayer and get started. Father, every night we've done this study, I've asked you to open our minds to understand the Scripture. I realize that you're the only one that can do that. The Holy Spirit reveals truth. Your Word is truth. Your Word is truth, and your Word is a revelation of who you are. So tonight we're studying the adversary. And we don't want to know him except to know how to overcome him through Jesus Christ. So Lord, tonight may your word reveal the power that overcomes the adversary, the dragon. In Jesus' name, amen. The Revelation. This is session five. We began with the church, number one. The martyrs, number two. The 144,000 Jewish sealed evangelist and then uh, last week was the two witnesses tonight will be the dragon the dragon is one of the main characters in the tribulation that's not surprising the dragon is one of the main characters in the revelation notice the two the tribulation seven years of horror on the earth and the revelation itself the announcement of future events. The dragon is at the center of both. The dragon is the evil villain in this story of man. In fact, there would be no revelation if it weren't for the dragon. You wouldn't need one. Before I get into detail about the dragon, let me read about his ending. Here's why. I don't like studying Satan. I don't like to study. So it makes it easier for me to study him if I know how he ends, he's crushed, okay? So let's read his ending, and that way it makes it more pleasant to read what happens before his ending. Revelation 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with a key to the bottomless pit. Now, I want you to visualize the scene. An angel's coming down from heaven, and he's got a key to a bottomless pit. That's an eternal freefall in the absence of humanity, okay? He's got a key to the bottomless pit, and a heavy chain is in his hand. He is quite an angel. He's got the key. He sees the dragon, the old serpent, who is the devil, Satan. Do you need any more names to make sure that you got the right guy here? Every one of his names kind of spelled out. And bound him in chains for a thousand years. This bottomless pit is going to be his prison. And his sentence in advance is a thousand years. The angel threw him into the bottomless pit, which he then shut and locked, so Satan could not deceive the nations anymore until the thousand years were finished. And afterwards, he must be released for a little while. Now, let me, let me paint a picture. The thousand-year millennial reign of Christ. He's going to be locked up for a thousand years. Where's Jesus during that time? The Bible says that we will reign with him for a thousand years. So two things, two things, that's all it takes, two things to transform planet Earth. Everything on planet Earth will be transformed by two things. What? Here we go. Two things. I just read one of them. Satan is going to be bound in the abyss for a thousand years. And Jesus is on this present earth. Jesus is here, Satan's gone. That's it. Jesus is here, Satan's gone. Two things will transform planet earth. It, it is totally different because Jesus is reigning, and I'm going to talk about that a little later, on this present earth during the thousand years that Satan is locked in the abyss. Satan's gone, Jesus is here. At the end of the thousand years, he's going to be released for a little while. Don't worry about that. You've got plenty of time. <laughs> Chapter 12 of Revelation gives four significant great events. Now, you're not going to understand tonight until you get those words. 
chapter 12, in its own writing, says these are great, significant events. And they all surround the dragon in the tribulation. What are these four great, significant events in the tribulation connected to the dragon? Here they are, four of them. Number one, there will be a woman clothed with the sun giving birth. The dragon is center stage in this event. A woman clothed with the sun giving birth. Number two, a large red dragon with seven heads. He is center stage in that one. He's center stage in all of them. Number three, a great wrath and a great anger. All this Center is the dragon, and it's during the tribulation. Number four, a great eagle. Let's start our study of the dragon with the woman clothed in red. Remember, these are all called great and significant events. So the first one is what? There is a woman clothed with the sun, S-U-N, giving birth. It's found in Revelation 12, 1. Then I witnessed in heaven a, an event of great significance. I saw a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon beneath her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant. And she cried out because of her labor pains and the agony of giving birth. Now, let's walk through that a little at a time. She's a woman. She's clothed with the brightness of the sun. There, the moon is beneath her feet. And she has a crown of 12 stars on her head. Who is she? Now some of you have been in previous studies and some of you, just quite frankly through your own study, have already realized who she is. Who is she? <clears throat> Do you need a hint? Here's the hint. She's in labor. She's going to give birth. I recognize there are different opinions. I, I know some of those specifically on this one. To me, <clears throat> this is one of the easiest pictures in Revelation to understand. She is Israel. She represents Israel. The Old Testament <clears throat> is filled with references to Israel and a woman with child. Now, well, let me just keep going and it'll explain itself. Isaiah 26. So if you said to me, what is it that makes you think or so sure that this woman, clothed with the sun, with the moon underneath of her, is a picture of Israel? She's pregnant. She's going to give birth. Who is, what makes you think she's Israel? The nation of Israel, the children of Israel. So let's go back to the book of Isaiah, chapter 26. It says, just as a pregnant woman writhes and cries out in pain as she gives birth, so were we in your presence, Lord, we the Jewish people, in your presence, Lord, we the Jewish people, we too writhe in agony, but nothing comes from our suffering. Now, a child comes from the suffering of a pregnant woman, but Isaiah says, we, the Jewish people, we suffer in anguish, but nothing comes from our suffering. We have not given salvation to the earth, nor life to the world. What's Isaiah saying? Our suffering was supposed to give birth to what? Do you know? What was the purpose of Israel in the Old Testament? To reveal God to the world. What was the birth that was supposed to come as Isaiah just announced? The knowledge of God. Israel had the knowledge of God. God placed the knowledge of himself inside the people of Israel so that they would have it only for themselves. No, just showing up, they would reveal God. They would reveal God. They would give birth to this truth of God. Israel was pregnant with the knowledge of God, but Isaiah sadly says nothing came of it. At least not yet. Israel was supposed to reveal salvation to the world, life to the world, 
This is the very plan of God. And by the way, what Israel was supposed to be doing in the Old Testament, the church is supposed to be doing now. Can I give you a crazy picture? All of us are supposed to be pregnant with the knowledge of God, and our life gives birth to that life as we expose ourselves to the watching world. We're pregnant with the knowledge of God. Not so that we just live and die pregnant. We should give birth to this. Isaiah said we gave birth, but nothing came from it. Or Excuse me, we were pregnant, but nothing came out of it. What is giving birth anyway? We use the word giving birth, but what is giving birth? It's giving life. What's the church supposed to be doing on the world today? Giving life. Giving birth is to give life, to reveal life and the life giver. Let's do another one from Isaiah, Isaiah 66. What are we looking for? Is the woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, seven stars, is she Israel? Well, that first one was a pretty good comparison. Isaiah 66, verse 7. Before the birth, <clears throat> before the birth pains even begin, Jerusalem's give, Jerusalem gives birth to a son. Who has ever seen anything as strange as this? Who has ever heard of such a thing? Has a nation ever been born in a single day? Has a country ever come forth in a mere moment? But by the time Jerusalem's birth pains begin, her children will be born. Why does he keep talking about Jerusalem and Israel and birth and birth and birth and birth? You see, from God's perspective, Israel is the woman giving birth to something. What is it? Let's go to Micah. This is interesting. All of these are Old Testament prophecies. Micah 5, 2, But you, O Bethlehem Ephratah, and by the way, that's where Jesus was born, right? You, Bethlehem Ephratah, are only a small village among all the people of Judah. Yet a ruler of Israel will come from you, one whose origins are from distant past. Now, I don't have to tell anybody in this room tonight who that is, right? You know who was born in Bethlehem? You know who, whose origins are from distant past? His origins are from, you can't see that far, so don't try. His origins are from distant past. The people of Israel will be, uh, and what's going to happen? Upon this scene, Bethlehem Ephratah births a son whose origins are a distant past. These, the people of Israel will abandon their enemies, will be abandoned to their enemies until the woman in labor gives birth. Israel's going to be abandoned to their enemies until the woman gives in labor, gives birth. Who is she? Well, you know, I know that Mary, a Israelite Jewish girl, gave birth to the Messiah in Bethlehem Ephratah. Let's keep going. Then at last, his fellow countrymen will return from exile to their own land. Now, at last, after this woman gives birth, those Israelites who are exiled in foreign lands are going to start to return. You hear that? They will return from exile to their own land. And he, he's the one who's birthed, will stand to lead his flock with the Lord's strength in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. Now, we know who that is. That's Jesus. The woman's going to give birth. They're going to return from exile. He's going to stand and, and not, not go to the cross. We're not talking about that event, are we? Well, how does that, you think this already happened or is this going to happen? He will stand to lead his flock with the Lord's strength in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. Then his people will live there undisturbed and he will be honored, highly honored around the world. You think that's already happened or that's what's coming? That's what's coming. This is coming. When? The thousand year reign of Christ. When Satan is gone and Jesus is here. So what does this have to do with the woman, with the dragon? What's this have to do with the dragon? A woman clothed with the sun giving birth? What does it have to do with that? Let's go back to Revelation 12. And we'll try to put together the pieces. First six verses. <clears throat> 
And then I witnessed in heaven a, an event of great significance. I saw a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon beneath her feet and the crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and she cried out because of her labor pains and the agony of giving birth. And then I witnessed in heaven another significant event. Another. The first was the significant event and now there's another significant event. What is it? I saw a large red dragon with seven heads and ten horns with seven crowns on his heads. On his heads. He, his tail swept away one third of the stars in the sky and he threw them to the earth. He stood in front of this woman. What's she? She's pregnant. She's given birth, right? He stood in front of this woman as she was about to give birth, ready to devour her baby as soon as the baby was born. She gave birth to a son who was to rule all nations with an iron rod. And her child was snatched away from the dragon and was called up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where God had prepared a place to care for her for 1260 days. How long is that, you mathematicians? Three and a half years. Coincidence? How incredible. Now, I'm going to tell you, this is, here we go. Here, here's one of them right now. How incredible is it that Revelation chapter 12 reveals great significant events, and here they are. The incarnation, that's a churchy word for God became a man. It's revealed in here. You know what the second one is? His ascension. Do you see it? First, let me ask, let me go back, back up. Do you see the incarnation of Christ in these verses? Some of you look again. Do you see it? What? God became a man. Well, when did he do that? How did he do that? Do you see his ascension? Do you see his second coming? All three of them are in this text that is read to you. Poof. All three of them are in here. Number one, his incarnation. God becomes a man. God in the flesh. She was pregnant and gave birth to a male child. God became a man. Number two, his ascension. Her child was snatched away from the dragon and caught up to be with God. So after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, what happens to Jesus? He stands on the Mount of Olives, and as they watch, he is snatched up to the throne of God. He takes his place at the right hand of God. What can Satan do to him now? What's, what's in the scene? And the dragon is at the weight of the woman to give birth to this male child. He's going to devour him. God became flesh. Before Satan could devour him, he is snatched up to the throne of God. Number three, his second coming. It says that one day he will rule the nations with an iron rod. The only question is when. All three of these events of Jesus are given in conjunction with what? All three of them are revealed around a central theme. The dragon. The adversary. The incarnation. The dragon tries to kill the child at birth. And you, li listen, even at birth, what, what's the first thing you read in the Gospels after the birth of Christ? King Herod, what's he doing? He sends the soldiers to Bethlehem, all the children under three years of age and under. What happens to them? All the male children under three, what? You're gone. I want you to visualize the dragon trying to destroy that which the woman clothed in the sun has given birth to. The deliverer of Israel. He tries to stop it, doesn't he? What about his ascension? He is snatched away from the dragon to the throne of God. The very throne that the dragon desires is the throne that has been taken away from him by the Messiah. Number three, his second coming will be with a rod of iron. Do you know what that means? In fact, I can't read over that. Most of us would not associate a rod of iron with governmental authority. But what it really means is this, absolute power. 
Absolute power. Do you think when Jesus reigns on the earth for a thousand years as King of kings and Lord of lords, all power, all dominion, all authority belongs to him, he's on David's throne in Jerusalem, do you think there's going to be a bunch of uh, uh, people from the other party around him and they make up stories, call CNN, get it to run on the news and start impeachment proceedings? Sound familiar? Absolute power. He's got an iron rod. Now, listen, some of you would hear that and think, well, that's a little dangerous. Not if you're perfect. There's nobody in this room who would not like to sit under a perfect king. The problem is there's, there's never been one until Jesus. You see, when he reigns, he will reign with justice and righteousness. Every person will be treated fairly. No one will get a bad deal. Everyone on the earth will receive the honor that is due them. He's not an evil dictator. He's a perfect king. Revelation 19 reveals what it's going to look like. And I want you to notice something. The same word, an iron rod. Verse 11. And then I saw heaven opened and a white horse was standing there. Who is he? I'll make it easy. He's Jesus. His rider is named the Faithful and True. And he judges fairly. There you go. He's, he has authority. He judges fairly, but he's coming to make war. What, what war? A righteous war. He's going to do what's right. Yes, there is a right, and yes, there is a wrong. He's coming to make a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title is the Word of God. The armies of heaven, dressed in the finest of pure white linen, followed him also on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them. When? During the millennial reign of Christ. How? With an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty, like juice flowing from a wine press. On his robe at his thigh was written this title. What? He is the King of all kings. He is the Lord of all lords. The woman in Revelation 12 is Israel. The dragon is Satan. And Satan is the enemy of God who will do anything and everything in his power to stop the plan of God from being fulfilled. Satan will lose. That's the good news. But not till the end. That's the bad news. That brings me to the second scene with this dragon. The first scene with the dragon was with a woman clothed in the sun giving birth. The next scene is a great red dragon with seven heads. Verse 3. And then I witnessed in heaven another significant event. I saw a large red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. His tail swept away one-third of the stars in the sky and he threw them to the earth. Now, now, now i got to go slow here. His tail, the tail of the dragon, has swept away a third of the stars from the sky. Swept them away to where? He's in heaven. Where is he sweeping? Where do you fall? He's go they've gone to the earth. Stay with me. He stood in front of the woman as she was about to give birth, ready to devour a baby as soon as it was, as soon as it was born. David Jeremiah says this. Interesting. Satan's path is ever downward. From heaven, he falls to the earth. From earth, he's going to go to the bottomless pit. From the bottomless pit, he's going to hell. He is on a downward slide. Verse 9 gives us one of the clearest pictures of Satan and his future in all the Bible. Verse 9, this great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world, was thrown down to the earth with all his angels. What is Satan? With all his angels. He's thrown down to the earth. Now, let's, let's pause in Revelation. 
go back to one of the oldest books in the Old Testament, the book of Job. What's Satan able to do in the book of Job? He's able to come in and out of the presence of God. He comes in, God says, Consider, have you considered my man Job? Where you been? I've been roaming the earth. Satan tells God, I've been roaming the earth. Well, did you see Job while you were down there? Satan is, is in Job, Satan has the ability, the power to go between heaven and earth. There is a future date in which he will no longer be able to travel back. There is a date. How much can he travel back now? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I know this. There's a day coming that he will have no ability to re-enter the presence of God. But notice something. He's been cast down to the earth, thrown down to the earth with all his angels. There is a future point, Satan knows, there is a future point for him of no return. Whether that's total as of right now today or an event that's upcoming, I can't be totally sure. I know this. There is a point where there is no more return. Never again will he enter the presence of God. In Job, he's coming in and he's going out. He's coming in and going out. There's a day when he's not going to be doing any more of this coming in and going out. He's going to be cast down to the earth. Do you remember the scripture in Revelation where it says, Woe to you, inhabitants of the earth, for he has been cast down to you, and he is filled with rage and fury, for he knows his days are short. Now, I believe that's a reference to the point of no return. When he cannot now re-enter the presence of God, he enters the final countdown. I believe that will happen during the tribulation. But who's thrown down here with him? Angels. What do you think when you hear the word dragon? I don't really get a pleasant thought regardless of how many cartoon characters I see. What do you see when you hear of a dragon with seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns? Do you think the dragon's ugly? You see, here's the interesting point. Most people would read Revelation and get that description. A dragon with seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns. And immediately you would think of something disgustingly evil looking. Do you know what Lucifer... That which is his original name means? The star of the morning. Do you think that's ugly? Or do you think that's more than likely one of the most beautiful things ever? The star of the morning. So I want you to visualize, <clears throat> I want you to work on changing how you view the dragon. The dragon is not ugly. If he were ugly, people would run from him. Look at this next scripture. The Apostle Paul describes the dragon, Satan, Lucifer, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. 14. He says, I'm not surprised even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. He disguises himself. He doesn't let you see the ugly. He disguises himself as beautiful. That's why people follow after him. The dragon is large and the dragon is red. The power of death is large. The power of death, the power of blood is red. I've always associated dragons with serpents. And so does verse 9. And thus you will find the earthly origin of Satan as a certain serpent in the Garden of Eden. I always, when I, see a, when I visualize a dragon, when I see a dragon, yeah, I haven't seen one in weeks. When I visualize a dragon... <clears throat> I see its origin as a serpent, right? In fact, you often wonder when, when the curse is upon um, the serpent in the Garden of Eden, you, the curse is from this point forward, you will crawl on your belly. What if before the curse he had legs? I don't know, but it's a logical assumption that if from that point forward he's going to crawl and grovel in the dust, it kind of sounds to me like God just took your legs away, you dragon, and now you will have to crawl. Interesting thought. Revelation verse 12, verse 9, again. I want you to connect the dots to, to Genesis. 
this great jack, dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world. Well, he's been deceiving the whole world since the book of Genesis. This ancient serpent, the great dragon. Deceiving the whole world with dragon evil that doesn't look like dragon evil. But it is dragon evil. Satan's opposition of God is not new. And Jesus said that this dragon, Satan, was a murderer from the beginning. Right? He's a liar. He's the father of lies. He's a murderer. He's a murderer from the beginning. I'll ask you a philosophical, theological question. Who killed Adam and Eve? And don't say old age. Who killed Adam and Eve? Who killed them? Satan. So you might say, well, it wasn't first degree murder. <clears throat> well, that'd be according to how you define first degree murder. But what he did caused their death. What he did caused all human death. He's been a murderer since the beginning. The word Satan means what? <clears throat> Look up the definition. It means adversary. Adversary of whom? Why seven heads? Why ten horns? Why seven crowns? Dr. David Jeremiah says this. Biblically speaking, the number seven usually symbolizes totality. And the head covers the idea of intelligence, conveys the idea of intelligence. The horns are symbols of strength. So the dragon, for the dragon to have seven heads, ten horns, speaks of Satan's distinct intelligence and cunning. <clears throat> Satan is a counterfeit of Christ. You'll never understand Revelation until you get that sentence I just spoke. Satan is a counterfeit, an imposter of Christ. And do you think it, he could possibly be an effective counterfeit imposter if he's stupid? If he's not cunning? In fact, many people believe, if you study, and there aren't a whole lot of verses of the origin of Satan, but if you study, many believe, and reasonably so, that perhaps he was the highest of all angels. The highest of all created angels. Which explains somewhat how he had the authority and the cunning and the power to deceive so many other angels to follow him into the rebellion against God that caused them to be swept down to the earth. He's smart. He's sharp. He's the, he's the imposter. He couldn't pull off this imposter role if he's stupid. So let me give you the comparisons. If Satan is the counterfeit, learn to know the difference between the original and the imposter. Here we go. Jesus is the light of the world. Satan masquerades as an angel of light. Jesus is the king of kings. Satan is the king of this world. Jesus is the prince of peace. Satan is the prince of the kingdom of the air. Jesus is the Lord my God. And Satan is the God of this age. Jesus is the lion from the tribe of Judah. And Satan is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Let me make something clear about the heavenly and earthly spiritual battle war. God did not, listen church, God did not give authority over this earth to Satan. I'm going to let that sink in a second. God didn't do it. God did not give authority. He didn't, he didn't create the heavens and the earth, everything in six days, and said, Satan, get over here, I'm going to give it to you. He did not do that. He did not give it to Satan. Satan deceived Adam and received his authority through deception. Same thing's happening today. So I want you to visualize something. Let's say that when God created the heavens and the earth and he puts Adam and Eve on the earth and he calls Adam over here and says, look at this beautiful creation. And I put all of this, all dominion of this creation into you. I want you to consider that what I hold in my hand is the title deed of planet earth. And God, had it, who owns the earth? Who made it? Who's, who has the authority to give it away or take it back? God does. 
So God takes the title deed of planet Earth and he hands it to Adam. Whose is it to lose? Whose is it to keep? It's Adam's. God gave it to Adam. And here comes the serpent. There's only one thing that could take the title deed of planet Earth away from Adam. What was it? One tree. One. To break the deal. To break the deal. To break the deal. And take the title deed. Well, that's why, listen, right now, today, whether we like to acknowledge it or not, he is the, the prince of this world. He's, he's got the deed. He reigns in power and dominion over the present earth. That's why the last Adam, the second Adam, is so important. Because I'm going to get ahead of myself, I can tell it's coming. He, he, he's going to come. Jesus is going to come and take this back from Satan. He's going to throw him into the bottomless pit. He's going to take the title deed. And that's why, what did I tell you? Two things are going to change one day. Satan's going into the, the bottomless pit, and Jesus is going to sit in Jerusalem. And he's going to say, it's mine. It's mine. And everything will be different. Everything's going to change. Ooh, I was almost going to get excited there. <laughs> that which Adam lost. Listen, that which Adam lost, Satan gained. And that is why Jesus is called the second Adam. Number three, what's the third significant event in this chapter? The wrath and anger of Satan. Ooh. That brings up the next question about the dragon named Satan. Does he have followers? <laughs> Does he work independently? Does he have an army? Does he have a bunch of demons, angels, demons, spirits. Are you with me? Don't, don't be looking for some pitchfork devil. Does he have spirits that can move through people, through societies, through culture? Can he, does he have powers from the heavenly realms under his authority on the earth while he holds up the title deed? Yes. Yes. Let me read verse 3 and 4 again. Then I witnessed in heaven another significant event. I saw a large red dragon with seven heads and ten horns with seven crowns on his heads. His tail, here it comes, here it comes. A lot of people, some of y'all are going to really struggle with this, I can tell. His tail, who? The dragon's tail swept away one-third of the stars in the sky. Are we talking about stars? No. Who are we talking about? Angels. His tail swept away one-third of the stars in the sky, and he threw them to the earth. To where? The earth. I've been to Chicago. I think a lot of them went there. I don't know why I said that. I have no idea. He stood. He st I apologize to anybody from Illinois. He stood in front of the woman as she was about to give birth ready to devour her baby as soon as it was born. Many believe this to be a description of the angels that joined Satan in his rebellion against God. I'd be one of those. If you want to argue about it, that's fine. I'm not going to argue with anybody. Satan's rebellion caused one-third of the angels to be thrown down to the earth, expelled from the very presence of God. They've been thrown down to the earth with him. That means they, they're operating under a dominion. They didn't create the earth. They duped Adam out of the title deed. And now they've got a dominion, authority. Why do you think, why do you think Jesus comes out on his hillside and, and there's this, this, um, this guy who's got legion inside of him, all these demons inside this guy, right? Every time, just go scene to scene to scene. When Jesus would come upon a guy who's demon-possessed, you know what that means? One of these fallen angels is a spirit that has gone inside the body of these people. And what do they say when Jesus comes? What do they say? Oh, don't throw us into the abyss. Who's got power? They know he's got power. But you know what? They need a body. They need a host. They need a place to live. They can't go to heaven. 
They need a host. They need somebody to let them live in, a place to live. Well, they're on the earth because Satan's got the title deed. And if you don't have Jesus, I'm going to tell you, you just made them a living room because they're coming into you. And the only thing going to keep them from possessing you is that you're already possessed by the other spirit. His name's Jesus. Don't throw us into the abyss. They knew who he was. He didn't even tell them. Remember when he would walk up? They didn't even, he didn't say, hi, I'm Jesus. No, we know who you are, son of the most high God. They know his authority. Satan's rebellion caused one-third of the angels to be thrown down to the earth with him. They've been expelled from the presence of God. But they, they're spirits. They can't just be nowhere. They've got to be somewhere. They're on the earth looking for a host, looking for a house to live in. Listen to the statement of God to Job. When God called Job into account <clears throat> for questioning him. Job 38.4 where were you? Job is, let me, if you don't get the context, you'll miss it. Job's friends and Job kind of been questioning why God does stuff. So God says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you know so much. Let me tell you, never get into this kind of conversation with God. Can I just stop here? Don't do it. You're going to lose. Satan's rebellion, excuse me, who, who determined its dimensions and stretched out its surveying lines? Go ahead, Job, answer me. What supports its foundations and who laid its cornerstones as the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Morning stars, angels. Stars and angels. He swept away a third of the stars from heaven. Morning stars and angels. You see? There's a connect, direct connection between the stars and the angels in heaven. And the tail of the dragon has swept a third of the stars, a third of the angels, out of the heavenly presence of God, and they're here. But not forever. Now, you want a mysterious follow-up to that sentence? Here it comes. Notice that Peter in the New Testament refers to angels being held in dungeons, gloomy pits awaiting judgment. 2 Peter 2.4 For God did not spare even the angels who sinned. Okay? If you think we're making all this guessing about the stars being swept out, God did not even spare the angels who sinned. He threw them into hell in gloomy pits of darkness where they are being held until the day of judgment. Jude brings up the same topic as well. Verse 6. And I remind you of the angels who did not stay within the limits of authority. God gave them, but left the place where they belonged. God has kept them securely chained in prisons of darkness, waiting for the great day of judgment. What's going to happen to these who are held? They're in prison. These demons that rebelled, these spirits following Satan, they're in prison. Here's the question. Are all of them? No. Are some of them? Yeah. When, there's a judgment day for them. They're held until what? Until the day of judgment. Are there fallen angels? Yes. Who is their leader? The dragon named Satan. The Apostle Paul tells us that they are not all in prison. Not all of them. Ephesians 6.11 He tells us to put on, all, put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. So why is the dragon standing in wait for the woman to give birth to the male child and destroy him in Revelation 12? I'm asking, why? Do you remember the curse in Genesis? Because this is the why. Why is the dragon standing in front of Mary who is a picture of Israel waiting for the Christ to be born so that he can kill him. Why? 
Genesis 3, verse 14. Then the Lord God said to the who? To the who? To the serpent. Because you have done this. What? Here we go. Listen. What done what? You tricked Adam. You took from Adam what I gave to Adam. By the way, it's not just about a piece of property. It's about life on the piece of property. Not only did Adam lose planet Earth, the dominion of planet Earth, Adam lost his life. It's not just about the property. It's about the breath of life that you'll need to live on the property. Because you have done this, you are cursed more than any more than all animals, domestic or wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I, God, will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And he, the offspring of woman, will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Satan must stop the seed of woman before that seed crushes, strikes his head with a fatal wound. He's got to stop it. Can he stop it? No, but he's got to stop it. Somehow, he's got to stop it. Satan tried to get Esau to kill his brother Jacob. Can somebody tell me why? Why, why? Why, why, is, why does Satan try to get Esau to kill his brother Jacob? Satan tried to get Pharaoh to kill the baby boys in Egypt, which would have gotten rid of Moses. Why? Do you think Satan can't see some of this stuff? He, let's stop Moses. Let's stop Jacob. If I can't stop Jacob, let's stop Moses. Let's keep going. Satan tried to stop the kingdom lineage of David. One of my favorite stories in the Old Testament. Very few people study the word enough to actually see it. Satan succeeded in having the last, one last seed of David. Remember, there's a prophecy that, that David will have always a, a uh, a lineage, a king on the kingdom in, in Jerusalem. And that, that lineage, that bloodline got down to one boy. There's one boy left. His name was what? Joash. And if Satan can take out Joash, guess what? Yeah, I stopped it, right? He couldn't take out Joash, could he? He couldn't take out Jacob, and he couldn't take out Moses, and he couldn't take out Joash. So Satan tried to kill all the Jews when Haman was in Persia, and God raised up Queen Esther. Anybody see a trend developing here? King Herod tried it in Bethlehem. Hitler tried it in Europe. But they have all failed to stop this one that will come one day and sit on David's throne, and he's going to stomp the serpent's head. Amen to that, whoever said it. Listen to what God told this woman named Mary. L listen, the, the longer I'm in the ministry, the more crucial... Luke 1, 26 is to me. And you've heard me say multiple times, I grew up in the church and no one ever told me about these five prophecies. Makes me a little angry. I grew up in the church and no one ever told me that inside Gabriel's announcements to Mary are five prophetic announcements. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of whom? King David, you think it's an accident? You're crazy. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and you will give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God is going to give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. It's coming. You think Satan can read? How many of you? Do you think Satan can read? You think he can't read what I just read? Jesus was born, and at the age of 30, Jesus was baptized, and the Holy Spirit came upon him in power. Jesus immediately went into the wilderness to face his arch enemy, the dragon, Satan. But not until, not until, not until the Holy Spirit, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. What is Satan? He is a spirit. 
Jesus is a man. Before Jesus, the man goes into the wilderness to find the dragon. What comes into Jesus? The Holy Spirit. Don't go find the dragon without the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit comes into Jesus. He goes out and what? He walks straight toward Satan. What's the first thing? Read the Gospels. First thing he does. He's baptized. This is my, God, the Father says, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Right? Goes out into the wilderness. He's looking for the dragon. Not until he's got the Spirit. He immediately goes into the wilderness to face his arch enemy. It was in that moment that Satan tried to do to Jesus, the last Adam, what he did to the first one. Are you with me? That's, that, that's what this is all about. If Satan can do to Jesus what he did to Adam, he wins. If Satan could deceive Jesus, control Jesus, Satan would return, retain what? His earthly kingdom. But he couldn't do it. Every temptation of Satan was met with the truth of the word. Everyone, I don't have time to go into them tonight, but everyone was what? Jesus quoted scripture. You want to know how to fight the dragon? Memorize scripture. And when the dragon comes and tries to mess with you, just quote scripture. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That's scripture. So when I feel like the dragon's breathing down my neck, I say, a scripture. I quote a scripture. And I believe he cannot stand in the midst of the word of God. Jesus refused to give up the word. He used the word as his sword. And you've heard me say it if you've been coming to church here. You know what? The world wants the church to give up the word. The only thing that keeps the serpent from getting you is the word. He can't come against the Word. And what's the world tell us? Y'all set that Bible aside, we'll all get along. Y'all set that Bible aside, and the serpent's going to eat you. He's going to come after you. After that event, what? Jesus looks the serpent in the eye. He returns to Nazareth. I love this part. Read the chronology. He returns to Nazareth, his hometown, and he opens up the scroll of Isaiah in his hometown synagogue, which, by the way, I had an opportunity to go to Nazareth, to that synagogue we believe is still that original synagogue. Powerful place. Wow. You want to go in there and pray? What a prayer place. To go into the place where Jesus opens the Isaiah scroll, and he turns to a certain place, and he reads this. What? He's just stared down the serpent. He's got the Holy Spirit. He stared down the serpent. He goes back to Nazareth, opens, goes in the synagogue, rolls out the Isaiah scroll. Here's what, he's reading. Here's what he reads. When he came to the village of Nazareth, the bo his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath. He stood up to read the scriptures, the scroll of Isaiah. The prophet was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll, and he found this place where this was written. He knows Isaiah, by the way. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. What? Of course it's on you. He's already shouted down Satan. He's already had the Spirit come up. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. For He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, and the oppressed will be set free. At that time, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. He rolled up the scroll. Everybody's looking at him like, what? Are you talking about you? He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, sat down. All eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently, and then, and then he began to speak. Here it comes, here it comes. The scripture you have just heard has been fulfilled this very day. I'm your Messiah. Now, what do you think? Let's do A and B. I like A and B. A and B. A, he's the hometown boy come home, right? Hometown boy done good. So, I'm your Messiah. So, choice A, everybody says, go Jesus, right? That's choice A. Y'all don't look like you like that one. Choice B, hometown boy came home, he's nuts. That's choice B. Hometown boy came home, he's messed up. I don't know what he did when he was in Jerusalem, but he's messed up. He thinks he's God. 
Choice B. Which one happened? Luke 4, 28. When they heard this, the people in the synagogue were furious. Jumping up, they mobbed him and they forced him to the edge of a hill on which the town was built. They intended, listen, don't, don't read over it. They intended, it was their purpose to push hometown boy over the cliff. But he passed right through the crowd and he went on his way. I'm going to ask you a couple questions. What power was trying to push Jesus off the cliff? The dragon. The dragon. He's there. He's there. He's got to stop this Jesus. Satan couldn't stop him. But he didn't stop trying. I'm asking, why couldn't he stop him? It says Jesus walked right through the crowd. How? Why can't Satan, why can't Satan push him over a cliff? Why can't Satan have Jacob killed? Moses drowned in that basket. Why didn't that basket turn over and drown that little boy? Why? Why? Why can't, why can't Herod's military find that one kid in Bethlehem? Huh? Why? Because you can't. You can't do it. Because the dragon is not the creator. And he's trying to stop the creator. He can't do it. Later, I preached an entire series on this next three verses years ago. Still one of my favorites since I've been at this church. Later, after they tried to push him over a cliff, John 8, 56, Jesus says, Your father Abraham rejoiced as he looked forward to my coming. Now, now listen, Jesus lived 2,000 years after Abraham. You with me? 2,000 years. And Jesus stands and looks at his buddies, and he says, Your father, all the Jewish guys, your father Abraham rejoiced, and he looked forward to my coming. And he saw it and was glad. And the people said, whoa, 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 you aren't even 50 years old. How can you say you've seen Abraham? And Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was even born, I am. At that point, they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus was hidden from them, and he left the temple. Can't a one of them in that bunch throw a rock? <laughs> huh? Not a rock thrower among them. Why? They can't do it. Which side do you want to be on? They can't stop him. Finally, it was Friday afternoon, 3 o'clock, and Jesus, the very Son of God, breathed his final breath on a bloody cross. Surely Satan, the dragon, had, could rest. Surely he's won. The first Adam was dead, and now the last Adam is dead. Surely Satan and all the demons were having a party, right? Satan's kingdom was secure. I'll hold up the title deed. Surely Satan turned to all his little demon buddies and said what? Ah, we can keep the place. The second Adam's dead. What if the very thing that Satan thought would stop Jesus from becoming king actually made him king? Whoa, I just had goosebumps jump all over my arm. What if the very thing that Satan thought would stop the king actually made him the king? Revelation 5, verse 1. And then I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who's sitting on the throne. There was writing on the inside and the outside of the scroll, and it was sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel who shouted with a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals on the scroll and to open it? But no one, listen, no one in heaven and no one on earth or no one under the earth was able to open the scroll and read it. Then I, the Apostle John, began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll and to read it. But one of the 24 elders said to me, Stop weeping, John. Look, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's... What? Anybody hear that? The heir to David's throne has won the victory. How? How did he win the victory? The victory's with the dragon, right? So how do you, how do, you do it? How do you do it? How do you do it? Do you know how he did it? 
Satan thinks he's won. He is worthy to open the scroll and the seven seals. And then I, John, saw a lamb that looked like it had been, what, slaughtered. But it was now standing between the throne and the four living beings. And among the 24 elders, he had seven horns and seven eyes, which represent the seven so, sevenfold spirits of God that is sent out to every part of the earth. He stepped forward. Who? The lamb. Who is he? Jesus. Crucified Jesus. A bloody lamb, Jesus. The heir to David's throne, Jesus. He stepped forward and he took the scroll from the right hand of the one sitting on the throne. And when he took the scroll, the four living beings and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp. And they sang, and each one had a harp and they held gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song with these words, you are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it for you. Why is he worthy? Why is he worthy? How did he defeat Satan? You were worthy, for you were slaughtered. And your blood was ransomed, has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have caused them, believers under the blood of Christ, you have caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our God. And they are going to do something. <laughs> what are they going to do? And they are going to reign. Where? In heaven? Doesn't say that, does it? Where are they going to reign? They're going to reign on the earth. They're going to reign on the earth. When Satan's bound in the abyss and Jesus takes David's throne in Jerusalem, that's who these people are. Now I'm going to close tonight with this. Satan didn't kill Jesus. <clears throat> the Jews didn't kill Jesus. The Romans didn't kill Jesus. I can tell you who killed Jesus. John 10, verse 17, Jesus says, The Father loves me because I sacrificed my life so that I might take it back again. No one, no one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. For I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and take also to take it up again. For this is what my Father has commanded. God the Father killed Jesus so the dragon wouldn't kill you. There's the gospel. I'm going to say it again. God the Father killed His own Son. God the Father killed Jesus so the dragon won't kill you. Jesus, a man, much like us in every way, would be the one to kill the dragon so the dragon won't kill you. There's only one that can kill the dragon. Here it is, Hebrews 2.14. And how can he kill the dragon? He's got a legitimate deed to the earth. Right? It's legitimate. How can he kill the dragon? Hebrews 2.14 Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood. The Son, Jesus, also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die. And only by dying, only by the cross, only by dying could he break the power of the devil. Who had the power of what? Death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. We also know that the Son did not come to help angels. Nope. He came to help the descendants of Abraham. Chapter 12 of the Revelation gives four significant great events that surround the dragon during the tribulation. I've covered the first three. But here's the last one. We'll wrap up. Finally, there's a great eagle. Revelation verse 13. When the dragon realized that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But she was given two things like those of a great eagle. She was given two wings, not things. She was given two wings like those of a great eagle so she could fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness. There she would be cared for and protected from the dragon for a time, times, and half a time. By the way, I believe the times, the time, times, and half a time is time is one, times is two, 
and a half a time is a half of one. One, two, and a half is what? Three and a half. It's 1260 days. She will be given the wings of an eagle that will protect her for three and a half years. I believe these events in Revelation 12 are to occur in the midst of the great tribulation. And Satan will try to stop the final coming of Christ by attacking the Jewish people and thus stopping the biblical fulfillment of prophecy. For three and a half years, God will protect his precious children from the deadly dragon as they await the coming of their true king. The great eagle is a picture of the power of God and the grace of God. He's been using this great eagle power and grace for his children for a long time. As Moses brought the children of God out of Egypt, how was it written down? Exodus chapter 19. Then Moses climbed the mountain to appear before God. The Lord called to him from the mountain and said, Give these instructions to the family of Jacob. Announce it to the descendants of Israel. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. You know how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. What's the description God uses for when he protects Israel from Egypt? I carried you on eagles' wings. He's the deliverer. Isaiah 40, verse 28. Some of you have memorized this. I have too. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men they stumble and fall. But those whose hope is in the Lord, he will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. And they will walk and not faint. What's the picture? The eagle in Isaiah, the eagle in Exodus, the eagle in Revelation is a picture of God's protection for his precious children. He will raise them up and protect them from the dragon, from the adversary. Are you afraid of the red dragon? On the cross, Jesus destroyed the power of the dragon. The power that could kill you. After the millennial reign of Christ, Jesus will kill the dragon by throwing him into hell. Verse 10, Revelation 20. And then the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophet. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. On the cross, God killed his only son so that the dragon couldn't kill you. On the cross, he saved your life. Do you believe this? This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the power over the grave. Jesus told the church that he has a power over death and the grave. He said to John in the beginning of Revelation, I hold the keys to death and the grave. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead is inside believers today in the power of the Holy Spirit. The dragon, he can read. He is powerful. But if you, now, does this paint a new picture? He who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. Let's say that together as we close tonight. He who is in me is greater than he who who is in the world. One more time. That sounded really good, by the way. He who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. Father, tonight, thank you that you have placed your Holy Spirit inside of us so the unholy spirit has no authority in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all.